This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second in our series on uh, emergency medical services disaster preparation. Um, this is going to be a very interesting evening, I think. It's kind of the beginning of a series of two embedded within our, within our lectures that deals with this particular one, disasters of all types, but is very especially geared towards preparation at the community level. And then the next one, next week, we're going to talk about the technical aspects of the disaster that we think is most likely to happen in San Francisco uh, that will be affecting everyone, and that's the earthquake uh, disaster. So um, what I want to do is I want to read to you exactly. I've been working with tonight's speaker and, and for quite a while. I've been here 18 years, and I've been working with Lieutenant Erica Artiseros for at least 10 of those 18 years. But I, um, I asked her, so what of the many things should I talk about? Because we've gone through several NERT exercises together, and uh, we work a lot uh, when we're doing training uh, for the different city departments and so forth, and how could I introduce her properly? And I think already from seeing some of the conversation and things, I, I know this is kind of the Erica Artisero's fan club already. But what I wanted to, uh, to read to you is what she wrote back. I said, you know, uh, you know do you, usually when you introduce a speaker, you say all kinds of things about their background and their training and so forth. And she said, I would like um, the participants to know uh, that I consider the main role of my position as the builder of a partnership between my department the city, and San Francisco residents. I also want them to know that I'm not a doctor, even though that is what it says on the website. <laughs> so it goes to show you that Lieutenant, Lieutenant Artisero's contributions to disaster preparation in the city have been enormous. And I think it doesn't take a specific type of training. You're going to hear from MDs and PhDs and all during this series. But I think what uh, Lieutenant Artiseros has to say is very important, very topical, and I think will help us in our goal in this series of better uh, education and preparation for the next disaster. So without further ado, Lieutenant Arceros, thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Um, a little bit about myself. I grew up here in the city on Fell and Fillmore, and I joined the San Francisco Fire Department in December of 1997. And wow, it's amazing, I have to say. And I have a lot of pride in, in just serving in the city where I grew up. And I really take it personal, the preparation and the interactions that I have with the community about what can I do to help facilitate what you do. And really, in the end, it's what are we going to do? That's the question that I ask most of the groups um, as I go around and speak. So I really appreciate that. Um, the other thing that I appreciate is learning from Dr. Brown. He's been steady and a constant for as long as I've been in the position of community training. And that's been really nice as well. He's so calm. I mean, any questions that you might have, there's a, a calm force with the experience and background. Oh, yes, the history of that is this, and now we. And it's really nice when you're doing some planning to have that, that resource. So thank you so much, Dr. Brown. Um, also, thank you to UCSF for even asking. Dr. Ye spoke last week, and um, he reached out to me. And it's an honor to be asked for this presentation. And the, the question that was asked of me is, what about the neighborhoods? And that is where I work. That is where, um, where we do. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about, at its base level, what is NERT, and at the neighborhood level, what is NERT, and, and then a little bit about what you can do. So. Um, um, we live in a city that can be um, a little divisive with uh, fire department districts and supervisorial districts, and the earthquake does not care. <laughs> so I like, the, I like the, in my role to say, like, we're erasing those lines and we're working together. Um, on the other hand, people do identify fiercely with neighborhoods. 
So as you can see, 810,000 people here overnight, and then that balloons with all those East Bayers to 1.5 million during the daytime. And what are we gonna do with them? And what are they gonna do with us? And how are we gonna support them until and they are able to return home? These are questions that we ask ourselves. But the other thing is that this city is a neighborhood-oriented city. We identify with our neighborhood. We wish we lived in a neighborhood. We love our neighborhoods. We hate our neighborhoods. We, there, there's just something about the neighborhood. And so even though NERT is a funny name, it makes sense for our city because we are neighborhood oriented. The other thing about our training program is that it's based on the fact that city resources will be overwhelmed. Any idea what those resources are that we're talking about? What do we rely on every day? Fire, police, ambulance. What else? What other services do we have? General. Medical, right? Our hospitals. What else? Food. Food, right? The supermarket, which has just enough for us to buy for the next few days till the truck comes in and brings just enough for us to buy for the next few days. What else? Utilities. Utilities, right? Our, what are our utilities? Our water, gas, electric. What else? Right, very important, the phone. We're, I'm on my phone far too much. I can't keep my battery in. <laughs> I can't keep my battery up long enough. So think about your personal journey to this preparedness as who do I know and what do I have to compensate? And our plan and all of our planning that we do is about compensating for the services that we rely on now that we may or may not have. And in general, it's not what we think about, right? We're thinking about what time does our next bus come, or how am I gonna get that parking spot, or how am I gonna get my kids to school, or I have to pick up my grandkids, or, right? We're, we're busy people. We're not thinking about, I should have a tent so I can set up in my living room in case my windows blow out in an earthquake, right? So we're not necessarily thinking, what is it gonna be like? And so I just took the approach that if anything happens here, that I wanna be as comfortable as I am when I go camping for two weeks. It's not that comfortable, right? But it's, but it's livable for me, and it's a condition that I've become used to every single July when I go. And so that's what I did. I said, what do I need to compensate for when I go camping for two weeks? And that's what I'll plan for here. Another thing is that I know it's so easy to talk about that big earthquake. When's the last one? 25 years since we had the big one. 89 was 25 years ago last October. It was, it, there were quite a few people affected. There were other people simply inconvenienced. But even in Napa, they experienced what we think will happen in the big one, right? There were water mains that broke or pipes that broke in buildings that caused flooding. There was an entire trailer park that experienced fire after <coughs> earthquake. So uh, on a small sample size, the people in that. But I want us to kind of adjust our thinking to be ready for anything. Because when we get ready for the big one, it makes us ready for anything. And the fire at 22nd and Mission was just the most recent example of people's lives turned upside down for something that we don't think is the big one, but for the residents, that was the big one. They're being moved, many of them, out to Treasure Island. Can you imagine if your, your life was in the Mission and all of a sudden somebody told you, you now live here, and they say, oh, but we gave you housing, right? I mean, there, there's, there is something to be appreciative for, but there is, needs to be a recognition just how big of a shift that would be to make your life be now out at Treasure Island. So I, I just want us to keep in mind as, as we're resistant to or lazy about or hesitantly moving toward preparedness in our own lives that it really is ready for anything. And that if you do that, that you'll be better prepared. And um, one of my favorite most recent stories was a woman who experienced an arson fire um, in the Castro just last month. And her son is 12, and he was freaked out, understandably. And she emailed the office to tell me that because of her NERT training, she felt like she knew what to do when at 3 in the morning, her house was suddenly on fire and filling with smoke. And, th and there's something about that training that gives you peace of mind and, and a little bit more assurance in situations to, to stay calm or to keep calm and to do what you need to do. And so that's what, that's what really um, I'm comforted by. So I have a 10 minute movie clip that is footage from 1989. Um, I love this movie and I'll tell you why after we watch it. <laughs>
time will be 5, 4, and 30 seconds.
I don't like that at all. tell you I just absolutely love that movie I love that movie and I watch it a lot um, what is great in that movie so I don't know if you noticed when I was pointing the green pointer the woman in that movie that was across the screen her name is Gail Goldine and we have NERT because of her she lives on Marina Boulevard. She brought people into her home after the earthquake. She was part of the, um, the shelter that Red Cross set up at Marina Middle School at the time and was very active with the mayor's adjunct office down there and communicating with them what they needed and what they demanded was training. And that's what they got. And amazingly, October of this year is our 25th anniversary. So we're gonna start celebrating in April at our drill and just continue with that celebration of um, Gail and Kit Haskell and all their work that came before us. And Frank Lucier, the fire lieutenant that made it all possible in our department and the fact that we're still having training. That's very exciting to me. Uh, what else do I love in that movie? Do you know when that man jumped up in the 49ers jacket and he said a 96 year old lady on the, in the third floor in the back? Please, everyone, find out where the 96 year old lady on the third floor in the back is next to you so you can let us know in that way. We don't know every person that lives on every block and every street in this neighborhood. Do you know how many there are working of us today, right now? Some say 299, some say 304. Either way, we cannot possibly survey every block if we tried. But you can, block by block, block, by block learn who lives there and provide that information and assist each other. So I love that. Also, the tone of that reporter's voice, did that freak you out? I mean, she, she made it. To, and then everyone else that was responding in the movie, none of their emotions mirrored her t making it seem frenzied. They were about getting it done slowly, safely for everyone, making sure everybody was accounted for. And that's what a trained person can bring to the scene versus the reporter's perspective of, you know, play this up, play this up. Um, in 1989, I was um, at Humboldt State and I had a TV about the size of this uh, monitor right here. And all I could see was that single fireball. I had no idea what else was going on um, in the city. And so try and take the media perspective out of it when you become involved in the response and keep us, we want accurate information, and that's what, if you're on the ground providing that information to people around you, that's what we get is more accurate information. Um, so, so many reasons I love that movie. The, it, clearly, singing at the ballpark was the culmination of everybody coming together, which we know happens after disaster. And Rebecca Solnit wrote a book about it. Um, and um, just, there are so many stories of neighbor helping neighbor, and that's really what, um, what I wanna get to. But I also want to talk about um, your preparedness. What are the practical skills that we teach in NERT that we know that, pe that you'll use most likely on someone you know? And what makes a team in a neighborhood? So let's first get to the uh, personal considerations. And I just do, don't want to leave tonight without making sure that everybody here has thought through and made a what if plan. What if? The earthquake happens and I'm not with the people that I need to be with at the time. What would I do? We will identify an out of area contact that we will all try to reach to check in. We will consider trying to reach them by text and get a reply because it uses less bandwidth. If we're a social media person, we will consider trying to access our media, social media accounts and make a simple post that says, I'm okay. 
So those are our plans for communicating our well-being. We will also identify two meeting places to get to with our loved ones after the emergency. And so I'll tell you my story a little bit. I have a job where I will either stay at work or return to work, and so I will not make a physical meeting place with my family. But my mother and my sister still live here, and I need to communicate with them that they're okay so that I can go ahead with my job and be most effective without worrying the whole time that I don't know their status. My sister, on the other hand, has a daughter, so they need to reunite. So she is building a reunification plan and a communication plan. So I wish I could, when you leave tonight, just hand everyone your personal plan, but it takes a little what if, what about, and what do I need? And then again, compensating for what may not be there after the emergency. The other thing is um, understanding that if the emergency that you're facing is fire, that in the rooms that you're in, that you identify two escape routes. And remember that a window can be an escape route as well. So take that into consideration as you put this plan together. And lastly, make sure that you're writing it down. So this is a little uh, checklist for yourself. Check in with my out of area contact, um, attempt to make contact for our communication plan. If that, if that, doesn't, um, if that doesn't work for us, then head to our reunification site. And that's something that's written down and stays in your wallet so that when the wheels come off the bus, you have a go-to. Oh wait, what did I say we were gonna do? Instead of the reporter getting that, your blood pressure up and every, wait, no, we made a plan for this. Let me, let me just start with this. So make sure that gets written down. The other thing is that um, you secure copies of your documentation. So you wanna have your important documents. What are those important documents? Insurance. Insurance papers. Who you are, right? Your license or passport. What else is important? Home ownership papers or your rental lease, right? These are things that you'll wanna show when, when you are displaced that help you get in more quickly. So um, some ideas that have been uh, brought to me is that you can make Xerox copies and put it in a go bag or send it to a friend so that it's across town. You can um, scan it and email it to yourself so that when you're able to get in internet access, you can go to your email and find your files. Um, you could put it on a, a flash drive and save it in that way. So uh, take into consideration that as well. What else is important about it? No local alerts. How are we gonna get information after something happens? So everyone familiar with the EAS? It's a high squeaky test sound and this is a test of? We've had some real alerts lately, right? With the flooding we had in December, those were actual alerts, avoid the area of. And in Marin every single year as well, when the flood, when the rivers rise, they get real alerts. What else? That outdoor warning system, everyone hear that Tuesday at noon? If it's not Tuesday at noon, <laughs> then you may start to worry. Did anyone hear it that Sunday night at 5 or 6 p.m. when it incidentally went off? It, it happened one Sunday that somebody accidentally pushed the button on Sunday at 6 p.m. How do you, if it's not Tuesday at noon, how do you find out what's going on? Anyone? Radio. Refer back to number one, yes. The emergency alerting system should let you know what's going on if it's not Tuesday at noon. The last one on here, alertsf.org. It's the only mandatory assignment I'm gonna give you students tonight. And that is to go to this website, alertsf.org, and type in your uh, text-enabled phone number and email address so that you will get alerts from the city when something happens, or as services become available, or as a shelter gets um, determined and open, or as water gets <coughs> distributed, or as a field medical hospital gets opened. This is the kind of information the city will be providing you, and so not only do you need to sign up on alertsf.org, but tell 10 people. Um, I believe that um, Nixle, N-I-X-L-E, um, is tied into emergency services outside of San Francisco, but I'm not exactly positive. Um, a website, N-I-X-L-E. I believe that's the website that takes in messaging from law enforcement and fire um, outside of San Francisco. But um, definitely in San Francisco, we want every single person on alertsf.org, and the only way that'll happen is if you help us tell people about it. All right, so 
I've talked about your personal plan, and next week uh, Matt will be here and he's going to talk a lot about your personal preparedness and planning. So I, I want to move into the practical skills that we teach uh, through the NERT training. And remember, again, when that woman's voice starts rising, if somebody smells gas and everybody's voice starts rising and you know what to do, and you come in with your calm voice and handle the situation, it's mitigated. So we teach very practical skills in controlling utilities. What are the common hazardous materials and how can we avoid having a problem with all those chemicals stored under your kitchen sink? Or if you have a garage stored on the shelf in your garage. So those are the types of things we talk about. And the other thing is firefighting, right? So a large fire always starts out as a small fire. That's how it begins. Mm -hmm. And if you are in the right place at the right time and have the skill to use the fire extinguisher, you could be the one that prevents us having that large fire. So we want everyone to know how a fire starts, but for your safety, we especially want you to know how quickly that fire spreads so you can make a good decision about, oh, this was a fire extinguisher fire, but it's not anymore, and I need to get out and keep myself safe. So we talk often about stop, look, listen, and think, and that's a size up technique to not rush in and become part of the problem and become injured yourself. And so um, as we talk about this, I want you to keep in mind that while we are training emergency response teams to operate in neighborhoods, you are very likely to use these skills on your own home or on people that you know first before you would ever need to use it um, on strangers. Disaster medicine is our answer to recognizing that what we talked about earlier, hospitals may be overwhelmed. So we need to decide who is hospital worthy in that moment. And that's a system that's called triage. And so when you take NERT training, we, we go through a triage system so that you understand how to identify somebody quietly suffering greater injuries than the screaming broken finger. And how do we test for that? We teach that through our training program. And also how to do basic life-saving things like open an airway for someone who maybe the tongue is the only thing between them and life, and you can move their head with the head tilt chin lift, and they can get air again. That's amazing, right? So being in the right place at the right time and having skills that empower you to act appropriately is one of the things that we want you to understand through this training. We also encourage very much uh, CPR and first aid training, but that certification is not part of NERT training, which is based in the um, more rescuers, more victims than rescuers scenario. All right, other practical skills that we want you to have. Um, we want you to know how to search for victims, how to get them out from under a heavy object using cribbing and mechanical advantage, and then how to carry them out of an, an area where they've been trapped for a while. So we teach a blanket carry, a chair carry. Um, we talk about how to search so that the team stays safe and stays together, uh, one hand against the wall, always moving in the same direction, always right-handed or always left-handed in your search. And so that is designed to make sure that you, that as the team, stay safe while assisting somebody that you know. So the question from the audience is, um, we, I have been taught to protect C-spine, and there's no way in these scenarios that you'd be able to. And that, as you do your size up, is what you're going to be deciding. You're going to decide, is this a danger to me and my team? Do we have a, enough space and time to work in, or are we in a hurry? And when you do that size up, that will determine for you whether you're able to account for C-spine, or we have to drag this person out because the fire is coming, and the C-spine will be a secondary consideration. So your size up will tell you what considerations you're able to, to um, do. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. So next are a series of pictures. Um, this is actually a gift from the Los Angeles Fire Department who started NERT, and they had a huge rescue pile. And do you see the recessa ante underneath the, the beam there? And so with just a very few people using the box cribbing and then the mechanical advantage, they're able to raise the heavy object and free a victim. And we understand that um, our job is trained in rescue, but we also understand that there may be more people who need rescued than firefighters available in a large situation, and so we want to give people the skills so that they can take action to save a life. 
So another practical skill we want people to have is understanding how to manage priorities of incidents and then communicate what is needed to the fire department. And we use that system called um, ICS, the Incident Command System. It's recognized nationally, statewide, county, and locally here. And as a NERT team in your neighborhood, you would also use that system. The purpose for that is understanding if I'm a battalion chief that's in charge of a geographical area in a response, and somebody hands me a bunch of information with a bunch of vagaries in it, I'm not going to be able to use it. So in order for the neighborhood team to get information to the fire department that's usable, that's why we stress this system of organizing the information is ICS. And we do a tabletop exercise in our, our class that runs through the, um, the scenario. How do we manage that information locally? And then how do we get that information where it's needed? Um, this class, we also briefly touch on terrorism awareness. And that is, how do I take care of myself in an incident? If I think I'm exposed, how do I self-decontaminate? How do I know where to go to get professionally decontaminated? And then how do I, um, how do I make a safe room if I'm told to shelter in place? So again, very practical skills for an approach to terrorism. We also really, really stress the disaster psychology, which is taking care of yourself, understanding the responses that victims may have, but really focusing on me, myself, and my team. Because if you're getting tired and I notice it and I don't say anything, you may go beyond. If I'm getting tired and, and you don't tell me, it seems like it's time for you to take a break. No, no, I'm doing really good here, I'm doing really good here. Again, we have to look out for each other. Did you have some water tonight? Dr. Brown brought made sure I had water up here. Just, you know, you know, just good team support to make sure that you have what you need and that if it's time to take a rest, that you're able to do that. And so that's what our fifth class focuses on. And here are some really fun pictures of the activities that we've had recently. Um, at the top, there's a triage tarp, so some of our NERP volunteers are sorting through some of our fun disaster victims. Uh, we love volunteers to come out and get made up and, and practice playing victims so that it makes it more realistic for our rescuers, that it's not just a plastic um, d dummy that you'll be assisting, but an actual person. And so we teach our, our victims to mimic some of the signs. And so we love to have opportunities to, to practice that. We also have a great team of ham radio operators. And I mentioned that your neighborhood team is going to be communicating with the fire battalion station um, in an emergency. And so that takes radio operators. And that's a hobby that people pursue on their own. But we have a lot of support and training for people that are interested in that as a hobby. Um, you do need to get um, an FCC license in order to be allowed to use a ham radio. Um, and then most people have their own equipment, but we also do own some equipment in the fire department if you want to uh, practice on ours. And each team will have a radio assigned to it in the actual emergency. So you take this training, this practical training, you make your personal plan, and then what? The strength of NERT is the neighborhood. Having leaders in the neighborhood that have taken the program and then voluntarily step up to help organize other people who have been through this training. Help get the word out to get more people involved in the program. Another key is having new people constantly coming into the team. If it's the same old people, we know, right? We've been part of groups where it's the same people. And we want to always be having new trainees coming into our program so that it feeds the neighborhood team. Another thing is we like to encourage our neighborhood teams to mix it up. Don't always have a meeting. We're having a meeting. I'm already tired, right? Oh, we're having a potluck. Oh, we're having a field trip. Oh, we're having a tabletop exercise. Oh, we're all going to go to a class together in ham radio. So having activities that mix it up for the volunteers on your team makes the team much more successful. And then I do my best as the program to support the neighborhood teams as well. Lastly is who do you know? So as a neighborhood team, what are the resources in your neighborhood? Who do you talk to? Um, Diane Rivera was in the Sunset District for years. 
And not only did she have an impact in the Sunset District, but she had an impact citywide. But she knew the Judah Street, Irving Street, and the Terrell Street corridor merchants. And with her team, she put together a booklet of all the resources. Where were all the hydrants? Where were the cisterns, which is our underground water storage? Where the pull boxes were? Do you know those red boxes on the corner where you can pull to get assistance? That still runs on dit dit da through DDIS, right? So your 911 call is failing. Your ham radio is crowded by other users, but you need help to that location, at least someone will know that you need assistance in that area if you can get to a pull box. So she recorded those. She recently, um, in, in December, moved to Southern California, and I, I haven't been able to replace her. She did so much uh, for us. But I, I wanted to bring her here because every opportunity she had, if they were gardening on Judah and on uh, the Great Highway, she brought materials to help support her neighbors getting ready. If they were having a, a potluck or a block party or other things, she just, she was present. She was present and she always put a nice face on and her neighborhood team thrived because of her leadership as a volunteer. She also took a team approach. She assigned some co-leaders. So in her absence, while I can't replace her, we do have a neighborhood team coordinator in her place immediately. We don't have a gap where in other neighborhoods when I lose that person, I don't have anyone else who's ready to step in. But in her neighborhood, they took such a team approach to being ready that we had someone to step in right away, and that's James Wong. Another thing about NERD is that we work by consensus. <coughs> and it's hard, I don't know how many groups you belong to, but it's hard to get agreement. <laughs> so we work by consensus so that people feel heard and that there's a process for decisions to be made in NERD. So another thing that I want to talk about are what are some essential activities. And it is absolutely essential, if you call yourself a NERD, to have your personal plan and your personal supplies and your personal readiness in order. It really doesn't make sense to plan to be helping other people if that's not done first. And so we want people who have taken those steps so you're capable of responding. So you don't find yourself flat-footed on your heels like, oh my goodness, I wish I had. So we talk about hurricanes and the warning that you get when a hurricane's coming to get, have those three days to get yourself ready. I, I submit to you that today right now, because you've heard me speak, this is your warning. So you're welcome and go do. Another thing is that we want you to be able to respond according to the NERT plan. We want people to show up in the sunset at 39th and Ortega and organize. And we want them along the way to do a neighborhood damage assessment so that there is information to work with. I passed this block and they need help with a rescue. I often hear people say, why if somebody needed a rescue would I walk right past them to go to the NERT staging area? The only reason you would do that is because you yourself are not able to safely make that rescue. You need the help. So we're not telling people that getting to the NERT staging area is the most important thing after the emergency. We, we look to the NERT staging area to have enough people to support what you need to do. If you're able to make a difference immediately, we suggest that you do do that. And then the other thing that is most important we're working on furiously right now is having block captains. Because the Sunset is a huge area. Noe Valley is a huge area. North Beach is smaller, but still a lot of homes in it. And so if we have block captains that are responsible and know where the 96-year-old lady on the back is on their block and know what the buildings are supposed to look like on their block, we are a lot better off. And so I go to living rooms all over the city when San Francisco Safe is helping build neighborhood watch groups. And we do a disaster plan with those neighbors. And I bring my friend Luann along. So I bring Luann, and she helps me kind of just drive home the whole community. And she is from Washington, and she made this program called Map Your Neighborhood. And so I take her with me out there, and we sit and we have a discussion with the people that live on this block about getting ready and supporting each other. And so let me just show you a quick clip from Luann. Thank you, and thank you all for being here again. I want to share with you a story that will demonstrate the importance of what we're talking about this evening. In 1991, the Oakland Hills, which are on the east side of San Francisco, experienced an horrific firestorm. 
that resulted in the loss of 2,800 homes, killed 25 people, and left thousands of folks homeless. That event was chronicled in our newspapers in the Bay Area for many years. And a few years after, there was a story that really caught my attention. Peter Scott was a young man who had lost his mother in the fire. She was 85 years old at the time. And as he was recounting what occurred, he made this very poignant statement. He said, if our neighborhood had talked with one another before, the way we talk after the fire, this never would have happened. And then he said, my mother died because no one knew she was there. If people had known she was there, she never would have died. This program provides a wonderful opportunity to talk, to visit, to get reacquainted with one another. We know as we look at disasters that people do better in the response when they know one another. In the emergency management community, that's one of the reasons that we drill and exercise all the time. We need to understand how our plans are going to work, but the true value comes when at two o'clock in the morning, as we are engaged in responding to a disaster, if I know you and you know me, and we have an understanding of the skill sets that we jointly possess, we feel a lot more confident and much more competent in our abilities as disaster responders. So one of the great benefits that will come from this program is you will get to know one another better in the process. We're going to be talking tonight about your neighborhood and the impacts that disaster can have upon it. So I think it's important that we start with making sure that we all understand what disaster is. <coughs> Let me ask you the question, what is a disaster? How do we define it? And in particular, what is it that separates disaster from emergency? We call our emergency responders, 911 emergency responders, there's typically four of them when we think about that. Who are those four? Fire, Fire and police and? The utility folks, and then who's the last one? Medical. Our medical folks, EMS, exactly right. So we've got police, fire, medical, and utility people. Here's a scenario. You return home this afternoon, about two o'clock, let's say, and something occurs either to someone you love or to your property such that it overwhelms your personal capacity to take care of it. What are we all trained to do when something like that happens at home? We pick up the telephone, we call 911, and we'll, in three to five minutes we'll have police or fire or medical or utility folks there to help us out. Is that a disaster or an emergency? Emergency, which is why we call them our emergency responders. Same scenario occurs when we return home at two o'clock this afternoon. Only in this instance, the causal factor is a significant earthquake but it results in something happening to somebody that you love or to your property beyond your capability. What, what's your normal response? What do we do? We call 911. Only in this instance, what happens? It's busy, it's jammed, we get no signal. The bottom line result is no one is able to come. Disaster or emergency? Disaster. And that's what we're talking about. I would like you to keep that in mind as the context for our conversation today. Things happen in disaster beyond our personal ability to take care of them. Bad things, people can be hurt, stuff can go wrong at our property, we need extra help. But in a disaster, 911 has been overwhelmed. So the critical question becomes who at that point responds to the disaster. Who become the responders? We do, exactly right, we do. And that's why we've gathered here today, to help us to be prepared for those very events where normal 911 emergency responders have been overwhelmed. I would like you to think as we uh, have that context of disaster about your specific neighborhood. Wayne, would you remind us, please, the bounds of the neighborhood that you have invited to the meeting and visualize that in your mind because when we talk about a disaster response, that's the area that we're talking about. Who did we invite today, Wayne? So I bring Luann with me because I don't think I could say it better. <laughs> it's so clear to me why we have to do it. 
And based on the discussion that starts with Luann setting the stage, we sit down with a block. Anyone here on a neighborhood watch block? Does anyone live on a block that has, is organized with neighborhood watch? One, one of you. Can you talk about that a little bit? We, we were able to use uh, the mapping that is available to all of us in the city at the fifth floor of the public library. Uh -huh. They have every single lot and structure in the city mapped out. We can access this through Google Earth as well now, but in, at that time we, we, we didn't have that. But right now, any of us with a computer can go to Google Earth and map our block. And then at each one of those, it's simple to put a text box and a link to each structure on that map. So if we're doing this electronically, we can identify how many people are in the building, their age, and what their needs are, the type of structure, access in and out, and so forth. The street is kind of complex. It wraps all around from Noe Valley down into Glen Park. It's called Laidley Street. It's, but um, it's steep hillsides on both sides. But um, it, it is presents challenges to try to get heavy equipment in. The Holly Park Station really doesn't come up there. Uh, but we have to be um, alert all the time to who parks there. And because we're blocking access to your services and so we try to talk to the captains and, uh, and and try to see how we can do a better job. It's really tough when your firefighters get a call and they have to get uh, their vehicle out, turn the sirens on, and try to get as fast as they can to where they're directed to go. Very difficult for them to do that if some homeboys out there in the parking lot rapping and uh, trying to talk on his way. You know, I mean, these are the kind of things that we have to self-police. We don't expect police or fire to. Uh, Take care of them. Those are the role of the neighborhood itself to do that. But I would recommend anyone here, to, uh, if you cannot get up to the library itself, just go to Google Earth and uh, type in your address, and you will see your street and every structure on that street. So just to be clear, that's the main library. What? The main library, the main fifth, library floor, fifth floor. Main library, fifth floor has, has maps, maps of, of everything in San Francisco. Every lot. Every single lot. And so you could use that as a resource to start your mapping of the homes on your block. The other, the other bit about that is not dropping a notice in your neighbor's door, but actually saying, hi, I'm your neighbor. I want us to get together. And that personal touch of a reach out from somebody that lives on your block makes such an incredible difference in your success of having people get together. And also having a reason to get together. Explain to them what the reason is that this gathering is occurring, because people have homework with their kids. They need to make dinner. They've been at work all day. They work that night, They're, right? So, so there are a lot of reasons why we're busy. But I just want, I, I want to make sure everybody is aware of the resource that um, is available to you here in San Francisco, and that is um, SAFE, Safety Awareness for Everyone, comma, Inc. And SAFE is um, an organization that is connected with the police department. They are a nonprofit that I believe 35, if we have 25 years, I think they have 35 years of service of assisting block by block, building that community through a map, a communication plan, and now a disaster plan in their partnership with us. And there is no charge for your neighborhood to have services of SAFE come out and facilitate your neighbors and just help with that. A series of four to five meetings to get started. Um, and again, Noe Valley, Glen Park are very huge areas. We can't take that as our, right, our span of control is what we say in ICS. Our span of control is not manageable in that bite-sized piece. So we need to take smaller size pieces, and that block organization is really critical to that. Yes. So the question is, if I'm mapping people on my block, do I need their permission? And personal contact information is one sharing personal contact information. But just being able to talk with the neighbors about, I know the people across the street have some kids, is not violating anyone's personal. Um, it's true that not everyone wants to participate in the process, and um, we're, we are an urban an urban area, right? We don't. It doesn't. Nothing feels um, suburban, or kids ride their bike in the street all together about our city, um, and 
I, it took a while for me to know my neighbors because I would get home and with my garage door opener in the portola and up would go my garage and in would go my car and probably before the end of my car even got to the back of my garage, the garage door was coming back down. And a neighbor moved in next door that I knew and she used to work at SAFE, organizing Neighborhood Watch. And her baby is nine months old and I've seen the baby three times. Well, I'm not home tonight, right? She often asks me, will you be home tonight? No. <laughs> will you be home tonight? No, I'm in a lot of other neighborhoods getting to know those neighbors in neglect of my neighbors. But that, that's the condition that we have. A lot of us, for whatever reason, is that we're out and, and doing our thing. But um, any opportunity that you have or a couple of neighbors that want to start the seed of getting this going in your block, San Francisco Safe will support and they don't charge um, for the services. They are a partner with the police department in that way. So from the audience, another kind of way that you can convene with people in your area is that each police captain at the station has a monthly meeting that they convene. And so on the police department website, you could probably check the meeting schedule for each of those stations. And so that's a, another important way to just convene with people that are like-minded, that are concerned about some of the issues that you may be concerned about. But also, um, and my next slide actually, maybe you were looking at it, I'm not sure, but um, having the relationships. So we encourage NERT volunteers to know their team before they need their team. We want people to know who the other NERT trained people are in their area. I'm also often asked, by non-NERT trained people, can't you just tell me who the NERT trained people are? That's not for me to tell because a NERT trained person is your neighbor who chose to take a training program. Their level of supporting the neighborhood is up to them. Taking NERT training is not um, a commitment that I come knock on your door and say, hey, you didn't respond to your neighborhood staging area, you're a NERT. I want people to understand that as they ask, or can NERT do this? Um, well, if you were NERT, would you do that? Is the question I usually put back on them. And if they say yes, then I suggest they become NERT. Um, because it's a collective effort. NERT is a collective effort. So in order for NERT to do something, one would need to ask themselves, would I do that if I were NERT trained? And so um, we want other NERT trained people to know who each other are, and we would like NERT volunteers to identify themselves as NERT to other non-trained NERT people, but that again is an individual decision by the NERT trained volunteer. And then in, along the lines of identifying yourself, we want the NERT team to establish relationships in the neighborhood, and that's what Diane Rivera did so well, was connect with the merchants that were out there, with a couple of the cafes that were out there, and with her supervisor. So I'm really excited to report that Supervisor Katie Tang is the first sitting supervisor to go through the complete NERT training and she'll be graduating next week, um, which is very exciting and I attribute wholly and entirely to Diane Rivera's efforts. Um, being someone who lived there and saying to her supervisor, it's that important, this is that important. So not only the supervisor but her staff went with her. Um, so. Again, Diane built that relationship. Diane talked about what it meant to her neighborhood where the supervisor lived, and that's when, when um, she experienced the success of moving her supervisor to action. What are other things that I like? I love team building. I love when teams get together. Um, the North of Panhandle team actually has had two exercises in the last year. We have tabletops. A tabletop is a sit down, talk through what if scenario. We love uh, communications practice. So in the um, Battalion 6 area covers Bernal Heights, Diamond Heights, Noe Valley, Mission District. And there is a very proficient ham radio operator there. And he gets on the radio at the same time every week for other ham radio operators to check in. That is called a net. And so he operates this net at the very same time every single week for anyone within, with ham radio distance to be able to reach that area. And it's a way to practice and stay connected with other trained volunteers and then also keep people involved. 
Yes, so the question from the audience is the Tuesday net still going on with the siren. If you are a ham radio operator and you hear the sirens on Tuesday at noon, you can check in on the net that is run by ACS, Auxiliary Communication Service, and the information that they ask is your call sign, if you heard the siren, if you were indoors or outdoors at the time, and where you are located. And so you provide that information, and anyone um, in San Francisco can check in with the Tuesday ACS ham radio net. Um, another thing is developing um, a team identity. So in Bertle Nert, they did a t-shirt order of t-shirts that uh, were designed by one of the team members just to kind of show their spirit. And so when the Bertle Nert team shows up at a drill, we know it because they come with their team spirit shirt. So individuals bought their own shirt, we're not able to provide that, but it really brought the Bernal Nert team closer together by having um, that spirit together. Um, in terms of practice together, this is just last weekend, the Outer Richmond Nert team um, just approached their um, staging area, this is Washington High School, and they asked permission to use the, their staging area for non-disaster deployment. And they walked out to the basketball courts there, set up a few pop-up tents, kind of laid out a map of how in the real thing they want their staging area command post to look. And then um, set up the pop-up tents and then one of the volunteers brought juice and donuts. And it took an hour and a half. But again, with that um, know your NERT team before you need your NERT team, Along that spirit, um, a little bit of time and a little bit of planning together, a few people willing to bring the tent and the tables that they had in their garage, this was a great exercise for the Outer Richmond team to get to know each other. And uh, I really enjoyed it too. I have a few other pictures of fun activities that were done. This is a tabling at, um, um, oh, Christiane is there. I think they're in the, I think they're in Pacific Heights at a street fair, Sunday Streets. This is out at Sunday Streets. Um, and so at some of the Sunday Streets, a team can get together and, and do some outreach. This is the Haight and North of Panhandle team at Cole Hardware. Cole Hardware had a sale, and the NERT team did a display of what some of the items are that you could get at the hardware store that are very appropriate for your kit. And so it was great because they were able to talk to neighbors all day on this beautiful day and um, it benefited the hardware store and they enjoyed the camaraderie and it benefited the, NERT, the neighborhood NERT team and it was an activity that people could do to stay involved. This is our booth out at Fleet Week. At Fleet Week we are on the Marina Green every Saturday and Sunday in the second week in October and there are many, many people out there and it's a display of capabilities for um, the Navy in water um, purification, in their medical tent, in their communications tent, and in our NERT capabilities. And so we share space out there and the kids love to come through and it's a chance to talk with them. This was a neighbor that graduated in the hate and then took her kids out to show them the shutoff. So she was taking the knowledge that she had and, and the reason that I was able to see it is because she put it on her Facebook and so I was able to see that and that sharing, Facebook, right, we're not physically in the same place but we're socially sharing our activities that we do is another way to stay connected and see what other, oh my goodness, that team, Rich Outer Richmond team did that, I bet we could do that with, you know, just a little bit of effort and a few neighbors. So um, again, one of my favorite ways of sharing. There is a NERT Facebook page and then don't tell Facebook, ooh. Hi, <laughs> sorry, I'm out on Facebook TV, but there's also a NERT person. So you can friend SFFD space NERT, and you can like the San Francisco Fire Department NERT page. Um, I kept the SFFD NERT person because I connect more with people that have graduated from the program, and so my communication's a little different than the outward facing page. Um, SAFE, again, uh, an organization we've partnered with has a 5K run, and so we had a NERT team, and this was one of the pictures of our NERT, some of the NERT volunteers that participated in the 5K run. We love the parades. So this is the Chinese New Year Parade and the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Again, we'll be marching, a NERT unit will be marching in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Um, you may notice the yellow helmets with orange vests. 
And in the picture in outer Richmond, you may notice there were green helmets and green vests. We have gone green. It is the national color for CERT, our partner organization, and so uh, we have not recycled, thrown away, or gotten rid of any yellow helmets because you can have a, no, can't have too many, right? So you can keep a spare helmet, but as you recertify, as you come through new training, you'll be wearing our new colors of green, and so nerds in the room, if you march with us on St. Patrick's Day, <laughs> you'll get the green stuff. Um, this is Jeff that runs the net in Bernal, and he brought out his gear so that everybody could practice using the radio at one of the October drills. So if you're passionate about something that is fitting the NERT model, then you get a chance to share it, and other people catch that bug, and then they want to do it too, which is very exciting. Another thing I talked about is having the, um, the damage assessment already in place. When you arrive at your neighborhood command post, we want you to have surveyed every single street that you pass and bring that information in, even if it's the street is clear. Because knowing what streets we don't need to worry about is as important as knowing what streets we do need to worry about, so we don't duplicate our efforts or chase our tail. And so this was an October drill where volunteers were in the Presida Park area surveying their neighborhood. And look what they found. Eek! Right? In that pre-survey, they found that that building is completely sl <laughs> sliding off of its foundation. And that was just by doing a, a neighborhood survey. We've had uh, PG&E out at our drills, and they show, demonstrate uh, wires down, they demonstrate their uh, utility shutoff, and that's been great to have them in person showing us what to do and what not to do. Um, we have a volunteer in charge in every scenario. That's how our um, chain of command works, or not chain of command, but our span of control works, is that people in ICS get a position, and so Nicole was the, the person in charge of that staging area for that day. We have creative volunteers. Um, and retired engineer Jean Lee, recently honored at the Neighborhood Empowerment Network Awards for his contributions to NERT, um, put together this PVC pipe uh, toilet privacy shelter. Um, so obviously you can go online on Amazon, you can purchase for a lot of money, or you can creatively get a little plastic and some PVC <coughs> and put one together yourself. And we have fun, don't we? I love to be out at the drills. That's one of my favorite things. So I try to make it to as many as possible. Um, our firefighters that instruct the program might go to some of the drills, but whenever possible, I want to be there. I want to be part of it. I just, I love it. So um, I have the opportunity to talk about what you can do now, and I know that there are a few people in the room that are already NERT trained or are going to recertify very soon. Um, but what I would encourage is that you do get trained. I think whatever training you choose, it means that you'll be that calm voice because you've had some experience or training. Whatever training you choose, it means that you'll be affiliated, which means when you show up, you won't just be saying, I'm an honest, willing to help person who you have to screen and figure out what my capabilities are. You'll, you can show up and do what you have been trained to do, whether it's Red Cross, whether it's NERT whether it's the Medical Reserve Corps. And so I have um, added the Medical Reserve Corps in so Dr. Brown can say a little bit about making sure that we register anyone who has medical training. And for the San Francisco uh, Medical Reserve Corps, we also put, want people without medical training. Quick example before I bring Dr. Brown up. For example, if we have people with medical training who are needed to assist patients, it's great to have people without the medical training who could set up the tent in which they operate and let the medical people um, get to the patients more quickly. So our team is a combination of medical and non-medical, and I would like to have Dr. Brown come up and talk a little bit about it. Thanks, Erica. So I'm just gonna spend probably less than five minutes, but just to tell you a little bit about what a Medical Reserve Corps is and uh, why it's useful. And if you have any level of medical training, uh, and that includes uh, the first responder kinds of training like first aid and uh, EMT, all the way up through uh, nurse and physician, physical therapist and so forth, um, we encourage you to use uh, the Medical Reserve Corps as an outlet for volunteer activity. The biggest problem that we have with what they call convergent volunteers is uh, confirming that they have the skills that are going to be needed uh, for the disaster 
or probably more appropriately to direct them to areas where they can be uh, helpful and still have some degree of safety for the public. So the example I like to think of uh, that I think is the most dramatic representation of this was uh, during the attacks on the World Trade Center uh, in se September 11th of 2001. Uh, there was, uh, as there are all the time in New York, some type of medical convention going on uh, with orthopedists in attendance. And it was somewhere in the Manhattan uh, borough, but uptown. So these orth everyone was screen streaming uptown away from the Twin Towers, and the medical folks wanted to help. So they uh, uh, well, commandeered, not, not with force, but, but uh, through uh, verbal persuasion, a bus. And so 35 uh, very uh, well-trained and probably very prominent in their profession orthopedists took the bus downtown, right? And so they showed up at the perimeter of the site, right? Well, that's not really where uh, someone who's trained in orthopedic surgery is going to be the most helpful, right? They are going to be the most helpful either in hospitals dealing with the injured or helping to uh, rehabilitate firefighters and rescuers that are uh, injured on the job, right? So, uh, and, and uh, all they had with them was what they had, meaning, you know, uh, their suit or whatever they were attending the conference with. Um, so the problem then became how do we take these people, how do we uh, organize them, how do we verify that they are, you know, Dr. Brown or Dr. Jones or whatever, uh, because some people get either excited and, and overstate when they arrive in their desire to help their capabilities, or there are people that, uh, you know, uh, pretend to be someone else, imposters, and they show up and then uh, they might very well be welcomed in and, and now they're uh, taking care of people in ways that might be harmful. So um, when a person goes through that process in a normal situation or even in an emergency situation as was alluded to in one of the video clips, there is a process called credentialing where their um, uh, qualifications are uh, verified or vetted, right? So, for instance, when I am uh, credentialed at the hospital, which I have to go through every year, um, I have to supply copies of my diploma and my um, license from the state and evidence that I've continued with education and so forth and so on. Each one of those things is actually verified. In other words, someone takes that information and then contacts someone other than myself to confirm that that's actually the case. So that process takes, on average, three to four weeks, right, even in a very rapid, well-oiled system. So that's not going to be an option for a disaster. We have in San Francisco in the EMS system uh, the credentialing ability to say if you show up with a license and a photo ID that proves that's your license, then we will accept you at the basic level. So that's at least some verification that you have that uh, 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 with you. If you uh, have a medical emergency on an airplane uh, and you respond to that, the usual qualifications that they ask for is exactly that. They want to see your professional license, and then they confirm you with the passenger list that you are who you say you are. You're not on the plane with having to prove that you are who you say you are, hopefully. But um, the point is that's kind of a mini credentialing that takes place. The advantage to this system, the Medical Reserve Corps, and there were, it, it has morphed over the, the uh, 15 years or so since the uh, 2001 attacks. It's been called different things and taken different forms. But the advantage is it's a mini credentialing system. So when you sign up and you say, I'm a retired nurse, I'm a retired EMT, they will actually do all of that background check and then they'll put you in the system so that you don't have to have, you don't have to go through that uh, when the disaster happens and if you then are able to and willing to volunteer. You show up, you have your identity established, and then you are pre-qualified to do the work uh, that you're qualified to do. So um, I encourage people to do this. And the nice thing, at least in California, is that it's cross-county. So uh, Marin County, I think, has a very wonderful medical reserve corps. They show up at a number of our uh, disaster drills with the disaster medical assistance team. California 6, the Bay Area Disaster Medical Team I belong to, um, they partner with us on various uh, trainings and exercises. And, and they're very uh, robust group. So they come in with EMTs, paramedics, nurses, social workers, respiratory therapists, surgeons, uh, generalists, and so forth. Uh, so I think it's a very uh, worthwhile program, and it's portable. So if you do move outside San Francisco or you do move to other parts of California, you can use it. There's a federal equivalent 
And I apologize, I don't have the name of it at the, my fingertips, but if you look at the NDMS, National Disaster Medical System, it should have a link on that page to what that is, so that if you then leave the state, you can take those credentials with you, and then uh, you, you can be very, very useful without having all your own equipment or without responding to your community hospital if you happen to be on vacation somewhere else, et cetera. You can just show up to the incident command uh, post and ask where the volunteer uh, uh, registration or rally is and then uh, say that you're a member of the Medical Reserve Corps uh, and you will be pre-credentialed. So did that pretty That's much great. cover it? Okay. Question. Yes. You always leave out pharmacists. Yes, I'm sorry, pharmacists too, pharmacists too, very important. And a lot of our technologists, because we also think that, you know, well, that don't, they'll only happen in a hospital. You need to be a uh, technologist in x-ray and ultrasound and so forth. Well, equipment is more and more portable and more and more facilities you know, California does have uh, three uh, field uh, transportable or mobile hospitals that can be set up, and these hospitals have radiology capability, ultrasound capability, laboratorians is another another great uh, medical related specialty that we absolutely would need after disaster. And now there are so many what we call point of care testing, handheld laboratory devices that that's going to be very valuable too. So. so uh I just wonder if there are any questions for you about kind of what the neighborhood means, what you can do in the neighborhood, um, any, any questions like that, and then I'll leave us with a, a quick feel-good uh, clip. Yes? Uh, about two years ago this week on Treasure Island, there was a two-story fire, a 10-year-old girl lost her life. She was, uh, it was a kitchen fire. She was trapped in the building, could not get out. Engine 48 came out at a community meeting, and it was a very difficult meeting because the people were heartbroken and they attacked the officers instead of realizing that what had happened. And they, they couldn't speak to the point. They had to be dignified and do what a firefighter spoke. But I stood up and asked, how many in this room have nerve training? And I know that you have a very vigorous person on Treasure Island because I helped her pass out flyers at yeah, the Emily. public meeting. And not one single person in the room had pursued it. They knew about it. If they had, in the second class, after your the second, I think, we learned how to not have kitchen fires, especially a 10-year-old girl alone in a house with a kitchen cooking and a fire starts without access to a, a escape of a fire. This is why she died. And suddenly the people in the room started to realize, and they said they've been in what we would call denial. I think that's the professional word, but they, just said we never could believe that it would happen to us. But I think this is common for everybody. I mean, I think even in this room, we all have certain levels of denial that this could never happen to us. How, how do you recommend um, counseling people to wake up and overcome their denial and realize the risk that... Uh, so I think the question in the room that's posed to me is really like, how do how would I motivate someone who may not ordinarily take responsibility for their own training or their own actions or lack of actions? And um, I, I have two thoughts about it. Um, I try to read people as I talk to them and figure out what matters to them as I present the exact same program. And the other thing is that I just try and tell enough people. So um, I worked at Lucky's on Fulton and Masonic for 10 years while I was in the fire department. And every year they asked us to sell the shamrocks for a dollar. And I was resistant. <laughs> and I watched my coworker successfully break all the records in shamrock sales. And I got a little competitive. And I started asking people, would you like to support muscular dystrophy for a dollar? Would you like to support muscular dystrophy for a dollar? And I got a lot of rejection. But at the end of the night, if I asked everyone, I had a huge stack too. So I actually flipped that to my approach to talking about NERT is that I don't need to convince you to do it. I just need to tell you that the fire department has free training that you can take and here's how you find out. I can tell you, and now I can tell you, and now I can tell, and if I tell enough people, we, they will tell someone in a way that matters. Someone will resonate with them, and we will also 
reach a tipping point in terms of people trying to get training. And so that was a shift for me because I used to tell the same 10 people over and over again, you should take this. <laughs> so, um, so that's my approach. And this may not be directly for you, but for- Dr. Brown. Um, I'm sorry, your last name is- Brown. Brown. Um, I am a NERT, and I, one of the things I did as a NERT was try to connect three individuals who represent three institutions in San Francisco. <clears throat> their institutions, <clears throat> I'm not going to name which ones they are, but <clears throat> their institutions are all places that would either provide food or shelter for people. And I know I've been at, it's 1011, I think, Church Street. I know about that, and I know the command system and so forth of the supervisors, uh, those who are supervising different um, entities that are involved in a mass disaster. But I'm a little troubled based on my experience. These people really didn't know one another and have not worked together in any consistent way, and their institutions <coughs> are within two miles, a mile and a half, two miles of one another. So I want to understand more about what's being done at the level of the um, institutions that may provide food or shelter, um, as well as hospitals, uh, medical care, to coordinate better than what I felt I was observing on a very, you know, just on one particular case. Sure. So let me see if I can summarize the question. Um, so what is being done now to improve the coordination uh, between institutions, but also between uh, agencies and services, if I can kind of generalize. So it's not just city versus not city, or private versus public, or academic versus community, but it's kind of how are these groups organized. So um, I, I have to say we have a ways to go, but having been here 18 years, I can say we've come a, a tremendously long way. I was very moved in one of these clips, uh, someone said, at two in the morning when I, you know, we're doing a response, I look around and do I know the person that I'm working with or not? So uh, I had that epiphany about eight years ago when the city had a three day long disaster exercise where they ran the emergency operations center for three days. And I was, and I do night shift in the emergency department fairly frequently. And so I was chosen to be the night shift person for the EMS response. So I was sitting there at two in the morning looking around at a whole bunch of middle and senior managers from a bunch of city departments. Uh, and there we, the, everyone there was taking the drill seriously, meaning we were working through the problems we were given, we were doing our uh, briefing and planning cycle and so forth and so on. And I thought that never would have happened before, right? That we would have people staying up all night to do an exercise. This was not a real disaster, right? This was uh, a fake disaster that we were working through. Um, and I really felt a sense of pride that we had actually accomplished that and that was a priority and a value. And the funny thing is, every once in a while, I bump into one of those people, a, person from the sheriff, a man from the sheriff's department, a woman from the planning department, a man from the Department of Public Works. So I think that that momentum is building and is continuing. I think where we, so, so within these organizations that are individually kind of in a little silo, each one doing their own thing, EMS, uh, police, Department of Public Works, and so forth. There's a lot more uh, cooperativity and interaction going on, so I'm a little bit more enthused and pleased that when we have uh, a larger scale disaster, as we have in the small ones, we will see that reflected as an improved response. Within the organizations, <clears throat> such as, say, San Francisco General Hospital, UCSF Hospital, I see a lot of that occurring also, where we used to have the doctors here, the pharmacists there, the nurses here, and then we all had our own little, little uh, scripts about what we would do in a disaster. But now, when we have the, the exercises in the actual disasters, the Asiana plane crash being one most recently, everybody is on deck, so to speak. Everybody is there and working together to get something accomplished, because that's the way it has to happen, right? When we set up the surge tents in the parking lot of San Francisco General for some of the Asiana patients, those tents were actually set up by porters who were being fed by the cafeteria staff who were getting supplies from a logistics branch. So that all happened within a very short period of time, like an hour or two. Again, uh, unusual. I would not have thought that that was going to happen. Now where we can go for the future and what we need, I think, is more of the cooperation 
in between the organizations that tend to operate separately because they're funded separately, right? So UCSF has a funding stream that meant much of which is different than the funding stream for San Francisco General, which is different than the funding stream for, say, St. Francis Hospital and so forth. Right now, we only do this on a, a, for exercises on a twice a year basis. We do meetings every month, which have fortunately spooled up, so the level of the meetings are better, there's more interaction. We have, we've had a meeting, for instance, with the pharmacists in all these institutions to figure out how we're going to distribute antibiotics for a bio event, whether it's a, you know, a, an attack or whether it's a, an emerging uh, disease that we would have to treat with vaccinations. So, so that much is done. But what I'd like to see is those uh, larger scale exercises so that we're actually physically moving uh, bodies like the uh, NERD volunteers that are moulaged and trained as patients, as if you will, professional patients, uh, because they can tell us a lot about their experience and what happens and how to get better and overcome the bottlenecks that are out there. So I think we have a ways to go on that, to be frank, and, and I, I want to see that improve. And I think we break down those organizational barriers by having people that are exercising together and then the people of the future, the young people, having them trained together. So there's a lot of training that goes on now with pharmacy students, nursing students, medical students, dental students, all in the same room taking the same course. There was a, uh, a young man here who was a senior, I think, with a Navy uh, background who had put together the disaster exercise for UCSF for all the professional schools, and they had a turn of about 135 people. It spent the whole day, and they concluded with a big exercise. I don't think it's here. I think it was in Cole Hall. I've forgotten. It was this huge room, and they had a disaster in there, and it was very effective. I came into the room, and I, I, they didn't tell, tell us about this. It was like a surprise at the end of the day, but it was perfect because then people had to say, okay, where am I? Where's my safety? What's my plan? How do I get, you know, all those things. So. Uh, um, I, I'm, for the future, I'm very uh, enthused that, uh, that a lot's going on that's good that will bear, bear results. All right. Well, um, I think that's, that's it for the evening. And um, I'll be here a few extra minutes if you had any pressing questions. I yes? Briefly, when I completed their training, I called my insurance agent, homeowners, and told them about this. And um, I said I wanted a reduction in my premiums because I now was providing more service to prevent problems. And uh, he wasn't able to do that, but he, I have not had a single raise in my rates since then. So oh, good. I encourage people to think of it. Even if you're a tenant, let the people know, and uh, it's a positive benefit. To, uh, well, if we all say it enough, then maybe we will. Thank you so much for your time tonight. It's good. Thank you to the people on uh, UCSF TV as well.